Welcome to the Dice Tower, a podcast all about board and card games and the people who play them. This episode, number nine, is part of our classic series and was originally aired on July 21st, 2005. This episode is sponsored by Dream Punk Productions, who are proud to announce the release of House of Whack, an insanely fun, infinitely expandable board game. Learn more about this fantastic game at houseofwhack.net. And now, here's your host, Tom Vassell. Well, hello, this is Tom Vassell. Welcome to Dice Tower Episodes 9. This was originally recorded on, or at least produced on July 20th, 2005. Now, this show is interesting uh, because we talk about our top 10 board game companies, and a lot of that has changed. I mean, if I did the same list now, I think you'd find some very different board game companies. The number one board game company for me would stay the same, but the rest would be shuffled around quite a bit, I think. And you would see some companies there that I wouldn't have talked about earlier and some companies that I talked about back then that have changed even now. But be that as it may, I hope you enjoy this episode. Me Honey, you got real ugly. This should be played at high volume, preferably in a residential area. Okay, now we're going to have a screen. I'm not even... <laughs> Alrighty then, this is the Dice Tower. <laughs> Welcome to the Dice Tower. We took our theme off the air. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna bring some theme music on next week. But for this week, we just put some obscure sound clips. So if you think you know what it is, email us and tell us that very first opening sound clip. I'll give you one geek gold. Uh, yeah, one only one. I'll give them one too. How about that? Okay, then I won't give you any. You okay, can get one. From I'll you. give you one geek gold. All if right. you can first person to email me. I don't think it's that obscure though. But we'll try and pull some. We'll do music from now on, and we'll try and have some obscure music. Obscure music. Geeky stuff, too, Charlie. We'll try to go geeky, because this is, you know, board gaming and all. That's my life. <laughs> Welcome to the Dice Tower, Episode 9. I'm Tom Vassell. I'm Joe Stedman, his um, very smart and good-looking sidekick. Second banana. <laughs> Manslave, as Rick Thornquist said. Uh, we are <laughs> broadcasting. You can find us at www.gamefest.com. Gamefest is the best, absolute best, internet board game store. And you can get all your board gaming needs there. A one-stop shop for board games. Gamefest.com. All your gaming news, all your gaming uh, needs all your in gaming one stuff. place. And not only that, you can find the Dice Tower. A board game show about board games, Euro games, American games, war games. We even mention CCGs, RPGs, and miniatures occasionally. But our first love is board games. Yep, definitely. Our second love is not war games. That's like yes, 70 no. second love. My first love is uh, war games. My <laughs> well, see, my first love is my wife and, and my first God. My first love is God. So. And God. And, and board games is like a distant fourth. But, you know, Joe's with board games. What can we say? Exactly. Now, this is our very last, hopefully for a long time, pre-recorded episode. We are recording this on June 6th. And this should be played around July 20th or something like that. So we apologize if not everything we're saying is up to date, if someone that we're talking about is dead, or some other strange thing has happened. Show no mercy. Sorry. All right, fine. I won't show any mercy. <laughs> See? I won't do that again. It's easy enough. One button, and you're off the air. <laughs> anyway, you can email us at thedicetower at gmail.com, T-H-E-D-I-C-E-T-O-W-E-R at G-M-A-I-L dot com. So if you have any questions, email us there. If you want to email either one of us specifically, then you can do the same thing, but just add, just do Joe Stedman at gmail dot com or Tom Vassell at gmail dot com. Yeah, something like that. So if you want to send, like, rude comments about Tom, like really horrible things, you don't want Tom to read them, just send them to me directly. If your questions, if you have sent us questions in the past month and we haven't answered them, we're still not going to answer them today because this is not live. But right. we will answer them in our first August show. Yep. Today we have uh, we're going to be talking about Memoir Forty Four, which is the bane of Joe's gaming career. <laughs> we're doing mini reviews, kangaroos and turkeys. I have a rant. Uh, we have session reports with an all star. I believe we're with uh, Barney. No, not Barney and friends. Sesame Street gang. And some gaming news, and then our top ten game companies. Yep. What are our top ten game companies? This one was a hard one for me to do, but it was enjoyable. Just because you didn't want to offend anybody. 
<laughs> I love I love you all. <clears throat> no, I have a top ten. Although the difference between some of them is quite minuscule. So the first thing we do in each of our shows is we talk about what's new with us. And since we recorded our last episode three minutes ago, <laughs> not much. But we did save a couple session reports to talk about. We had two session reports since our last episode in which we played a variety of games. We played In a Pickle, a mm -hmm. party game. Yep. Uh, we played Medina to Mecca, which is like Settler's Light. And since Settler's is already light, it means the game is ultra light. And in this game, I must say, I saw some of the most blatant king-making maneuvering I've ever seen. What are you talking about? What was going to happen was on my turn, I was going to win. Yeah. So everyone decided to try and trade with the person before me so that they would win, not me. So? Which is king-making, which oh, is evil on. and wrong. If it happened to you, you would have been mad. <laughs> not in the, a family, not in a, it's a party game. Who but cares? what was satisfying was the fact that they could not complete the trade, therefore I won the game. Yeah. Well. Joe says you're not allowed to win your own games. I don't, <laughs> if that was true, I would never get to win. True. Anyway, enough. so we also, what else did we play? We played Rubble Rally. We talked about that yeah, last time. Yeah. It was a good, good game. Then we, the next day we played Fresh Fish. Which is an interesting game. Right, and I'm going to talk about that in my kangaroo section today. Uh, what else did we play? Oh, Goldland. Mm. Now, see, I heard a lot about Goldland. I heard it was an interesting game <laughs> that it was one of those games that was exploration. And I like exploration games. Um, I like Lost Valley. And Joe, Joe likes exploration games, too. Yeah. And it actually, when the final scores like of the Nautilus. game were... When the Nautilus? Yeah, that's uh -huh. exploration. Just threw that out there. When the, when the final scores of the game were counted, it was a one-point difference between uh, Joe and me. Are we still on the air, Tom? We are still on the air, but I've lost my internet connection, which we will have to restore to get us on the air. <laughs> uh -oh. So, anyway, so Goldland was not as fun as I thought it would be. All right. There was, like, things were in the middle of the desert using rope to catch fish just it didn't always fit together thematically right and joe got stuck in a square one time and, oh man and he couldn't move for six turns and it was it was okay i maybe i'm getting spoiled i, I just didn't think it was as good as other games we played can i, can I give a song clip what i thought of it i guess now you see that evil will always triumph because good is dumb <laughs> All right, good. Now pay attention to the show and stop looking at sound clips. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, so we also played a game, Astroplane, which goes down in history as one of the shortest games we played because yeah. everyone thought it was dumb halfway through. I'll write a review that will be somewhat kinder, but not too kind. Mm. Um, All right. I, 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 told, I told another one of the gamers I'd be willing to play it again with two people just to see how it would work out with two. Because sometimes... Well, I've already played with two people. It's okay. Abstract games are better it, with two. Abstract games shouldn't be that hard to think about. And what was our final game we played? Oh, Fresh Fish. Fresh yeah. Fish, yeah. So those are the games that we played. So let's Five get to planetary our, games. Let's get to our questions. Our first question is actually a comment <coughs> from Walt O'Hara. He said to answer Tom's curiosity about the word shill, I didn't actually have any curiosity. Or did I? I don't know. 1916, one who acts as a decoy for a gambler, auctioneer, etc. So if anyone comes and talks about their own game, I guess they're not a shill because they're not being a decoy. There you go. And then he gives a whole bunch of other nonsense that I don't really care about. <laughs> Thanks, Walt. Now, <clears throat> this is the most important question of the day. Oh, and it's goodness. a long one, okay? Walt O'Hara asks Joe this question, and then Kimbo from Board Game Geek, Kim Beatty, uh, adds some more remarks. So I'm going to read all the stuff that they said, and then Joe <coughs> will give you a few minutes to respond yeah, yeah, in an yeah. orderly fashion. All right, I'm ready. Hit me, hit me, Here hit comes me. Walt. Cut, cut says, me, Mick, cut me, Mick. Joe, what's your beef with Memoir 44? Again, you're not really explaining your dislike very coherently. <laughs> sure, Memoir 44 is easy to the point of ex stillness, but don't you place any value on a game system that you can teach to little kids? Memoir 44 might not be the streets of Stalingrad, but it gets high marks from me for being so accessible. Kimbo says, regarding the Memoir 44 controversy, I agree that Memoir 44 is a good game. He's obviously agreeing with me. Yeah. Whether it is a simulation or not appears to be open to debate. For example, here are some arguments I've read elsewhere to support the claim that Memoir 44 is a simulation. Quote, Memoir 44 has scenarios, terrain, geographic and attritional victory conditions, movement, fire, combat, overruns, line of sight, 
lots of different types of units, command control, and special rules for things like beach landings. Please explain what it is that makes Memoir 44 not a simulation. Quote, in any case, it clearly is a simulation, or to be more accurate, a military simulation, since it's an attempt to represent a historical battle or campaign in the form of a game. Whether it's a good simulation is another matter, and a separate question as to whether it's a good game or not. Those people who are convinced that Memoir 44 is not a simulation should enlighten us with an explanation of exactly what it takes for a game to be one. No hand-waving or I know it when I see it replies, please. Uh, man, he took Jimbo my answer. says, my opinion is that the IGA, the International Gaming Awards, should have used the word game instead of simulation in the category title, Best Historical Game. Hey, that's maybe the Otherwise, they risk the credibility of the IGA by miscategorizing games in much the same way that have caused the Origin Awards to become the laughing stock of this hobby. So before Joe answers, let me mention this. What started all this was we talked about the International Gaming Awards. And mm -hmm. they have two categories, one for board games, general strategy, and they have one for historical simulations. And Memoir 44 was nominated for that award. Mm -hmm. And Joe said that was wrong. That's, is it my turn to talk yet? Go ahead. <laughs> Joe will now defend right. a stupid decision. All right, now let me just start off with a story. Can I start off with a story? I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Star Trek fan. All right, and uh, there's something in Star Trek that we have that's uh, a common thing that us Trekkies do is we explain away things. For instance, if you were to watch the original show with Captain Kirk, you would see that the Klingons looked really funky. They didn't look anything like the Jean-Luc Picard Klingons. And so we do a, we call a, a, a we can, there's many names, I call it a Roddenberryism. You, you do a Roddenberryism and you explain away why the Klingons don't look the same way as they did with Kirk, as they do with Picard. And so you try to just think of things to try to explain it. And to me, that's Memoir 44. Oh, it's a simulation because it's got his military units and it's got... What is all those things that he listed? All these things. I think he was just trying... You Come on now, you're not even making sense now. What do you mean I'm not making sense? It's my turn, you shut up. <laughs> okay, nice. <laughs> He's, you're, you're, just, you're adding on things that aren't necessarily there. He says me, Memoir has scenarios. Does it have scenarios? Check. Terrain, check. What do you Geographic. Oh, come on, what do you mean terrain? <sighs> yeah, yeah. Geographical and attritional victory conditions, check. Movement, definitely check. Fire combat, check. Overruns, check. Line of sight, check. Lots of different types of units. Well, I don't know, three is lots of different types, but <laughs> command control. All right, there's here, there's, special okay, rules okay, for things okay, like right, beach lanes. All right, butt out, butt out. You told me to read it. I'm going to start playing video audio clips again. <laughs> if you touch that button, I'm done. <laughs> oh, anyway. Get on person it. <laughs> I'm the rest of the show myself. All right, yeah, well, anyway. Another thing is, it's not a simulation for two... Well, say what you... Everyone has their own opinion. To me, you take... Okay, a war game, even the best war games, you got to have some randomness, okay? So a lot, of random, a lot of randomness in war games is with a die roll. You have a CRT or a combat results table, and you consult that with a die roll. This game not only has die rolls, which are very rampant, it's also got cards, which are totally random. So you got randomness adding to randomness, and if you tell me that's a simulation, I tell you that you don't have a clue, all right? You can, you can take it and put it into any theme. You can take Memoir 44 system of cards and dice mixed together for total chaos, and you can, you can make any theme. You could have the frogs versus the flies, and, you know, the flies can have fast flies, slow flies, and, and you maggots. You can do that with any game. No, that's not true. See, you that, can do that with any game. You can no, change no, no, any no, game. No, 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 no. No, you can't. That's yes. just, let me finish talking, Tom. <laughs> All right? To me, a historical game cannot be separated from the mechanics of the game. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. Otherwise, it's not historical. That's the difference between a regular a game and a historical game to me. You, they can't stand alone. You can't transpose the, the game into... You can't trans, transpose the theme into the same thing. Unless it's a very war... Okay, like, for instance, two different types of ancients. If you want to do, you know, um, Polynesian Wars and transpose that into Alexandrian, fine. Because they're, they're pretty similar in their, in their um, specifics. But you can't say... I don't know. Why can't I take the game Breakout Normandy and say that it's about a bunch of viruses trying to break out of the stomach in someone's body? Because there's nothing. To, because anti-tank guns have nothing to do, and armor penetration. I, 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 make, and I make totally different. I, I make them all the whether, different. Whether, whether, see, no, no, no. You're you're doing a very complicated transposition. I'm talking about a. You're, you can just do a easy, ten minutes. If you can sit down for ten minutes and and rewrite the rules then that's not historical. If it takes you hours or a week to rewrite the rules to, to, to add a new theme, then that's, that's different. So answer the question, what makes a game a simulation? 
what makes the game a simulation? Yeah. It accurately simulates something that happened in history. Or well, it simulates lots, a situation. I, I've interviewed these game designers. Lots of them say deliberately that they, they, they change things so it makes it a better game. Of course, because otherwise... There's two types of get war games. There's war games that are games, and there's war games that are simulations. No, all war games, all war games cut corners. They have to. No, there's so maybe, there's there, 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 there are two games. Or three that don't. There are games. There are, there are there are simulations, Tom, that I play that you don't try to win. You just try to see how you do compared to how they did historically, by so changing game. by changing a few decisions. You, you, it's a game because there's a randomness factor. Otherwise, you, why play? If I make X decision, how does that uh, you know affect the, the, the this outcome? Okay. That's that's then this is a historical Memoir, simulation. When we play Memoir Forty Four, let's play let's say we play Omaha Beach scenario. Okay. That is a scenario of one of the beach landings that the Normandy invasion in World War Two. How is that not a simulation? We are simulating the landing of the troops. Okay. Well, where's the landing craft? Where's the the vehicle? Um, why does there have to why, be a landing craft? Why it be a How are they? How are they? <laughs> where? There's too many there's too many factors that are just being abstracted away to make it a simulation. I don't think I need to argue much here. I think people are just going to listen to the show and understand the truth. <laughs> I, I don't think you... Okay, here's this. If Joe gets 10 people to agree with him, I'll, 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 I'll I don't know. I'll Holy publicly dude, apologize. Dance a jig? Online. Because <laughs> this is... Because I, I haven't seen anyone agree with you yet. What are you talking about? It's because you only read Board Game Geek, snob. Then have the constant world people send me email at tomvassal at gmail.com that, that where they say Memoir 44 is not a simulation. If you agree with Joe that Memoir 44 is not a simulation, email me. Anybody, email me. No, all that aside... I don't think I'll get one email. All that, all that aside, I still think it's a fun game. Just like I think that chess is a fun game, but chess is not a simulation. Chess does not you claim can, to be a simulation. But if you change the figures of chess and made them into little Civil War characters, you could maybe say it's a simulation, Tom. But we <laughs> didn't. So but that's your whole that. reasoning. It's not a simulation. Okay. And I'm raising my hand. I know, because it doesn't feel like one. <laughs> Email me. Email me if you agree with Joe. Oh. Email me if you don't, because I like to read a whole lot of letters about it. <laughs> And Eric, if you listen to this show, I like the game. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, well, Joe's just been banned from Days of Wonders premises. <laughs> All right, well, here's a question for me. It's not quite as controversial. Let me read it then. Where is it at? Very top. Hey, Tom. With the exception of Kremlin and Atlantic Storm, most of the games mentioned in your thematic games list seem to be manufactured in the last five years or so. Do you not play anything older? Well, I think that theme has become more heavy in the last five years. That's why they're probably most of them are from those. Um, do we play games that are older? Definitely. Not nearly as often, but we do. We just, Like I said, we just played Rubble Rally, which is 10 years old. If you took the average game collection, if you took my, I, this would be interesting, Tom, we should do this if we have free time. Take the average age of your game collection compared to the average age of my game collection, I think I beat you by at least 10 years. Okay. You disagree or you agree? I agree. I don't care. <laughs> I like new games. You like new games because that's all you got to choose from. But I have a couple games that are like from the 1800s. I have chess, so I win. The 1800s. I have, I have, I have Go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I have those games too, so they cancel out. I, I have like five copies of chess, though. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Man, oh man. Wasn't that a good one? No. You don't like that one? All right. Those are all our real questions. Now we're down to questions we pull from Board Game Geek. To its strategy? Can you take a swig of whack juice and still fend off the queen of heartaches with only a hamster launcher while teetering on the edge of inevitable darkness? Try House of Whack from Dream Punk Productions. Learn more at houseofwhack.net. First one says... The drivel. Yeah, Board Game Geek has a section called uh, Geek Questions where you can ask questions about everything. And there's a lot of sludge, a lot of... Wasted time. Questions that are just a waste of everyone's time to play. To even answer... Um, but there are some good questions, so here's one of them. Which game have you changed your opinion of the most from what it was at first? So I guess this would fit in our kangaroos and turkeys. Of all the games you've ever played, which is the one that you've changed the most? I wrote this down somewhere. Go ahead, and you do yours first. I thought I did. I think mine's Tigers and Euphrates, because I actually thought I hated it when we first played it, and now I enjoy it tremendously. Hmm. Uh, so I think that's my biggest, my biggest switch. Your biggest switch is that one? Because may, maybe diplomacy, because I thought I would like it, <laughs> and, and now I despise it with a passion. It's only rivaled by the hatred I have for people 
who massacre innocent children. <laughs> Man, I don't know. I don't know. It's interesting. I, I wrote. I had some ideas, but uh, diplomacy is a big one because. But I don't think it's not. Mine's the opposite. Oh, because you knew you'd like it, so. I knew I'd like it, but I didn't know I'd like it so much. I don't know. I mean, let me think about that. For All a right. While. So we'll come back to that. All right. Here's the next question. How many times a day do you hit Board Game Geek? By hit, I assume I mean. Click on it. <laughs> click on it. <laughs> Uh, it depends on if it's a work day or not. So you're saying you hit, of course, a lot less on a work day. Oh, of course. Our boss won't listen to you. Oh, in that case, no, I listen to it. I, I probably could check it more at work. <laughs> yeah, Joe's probably right. I don't... I I, it's, I check it every morning after, Board game my, after my email. It dies on the weekends. It yeah. really does. There's nothing going on. Not nothing, but there's a whole lot less. I, I check it when I get up. It's one of the last sites I check before I go to bed. I'd, I'd say I check it four or five times a day. I have to, I do the same thing every time I, I log on. I, I click on my inbox for my Yahoo Mail. I click on my I right click on my Gmail inbox. I click on Consum World and I click on Board Game Geek. And those are my four things I do. Yeah, I check Consum World about once every three days. But I check Board Game Geek three 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 or four times a day. All right, what is one game that you've regretted buying? Mine's hands down Tenjo. <laughs> Tenjo, T-E-N-J-O. Well, the company's out of business, so it's not like we're hurting them anymore. What's the game plague. that I've regretted buying? Mm. <laughs> How about uh, Thieves of Baghdad? <laughs> Star Wars collectible card game. Why? Because the... uh, I spent like $600, and then 10 days later they went out of business, and I could have got my collection for uh, 100 sm- bucks. A smidgen of that. Yeah. yeah. So that's probably it, just because of the massive influx of price. All right, here's one for you, Joe. Name one thing you like about Monopoly. The little cannon. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, The get-out-of-jail-free card. It just kind of made its way into pop culture. Oh, a lot more than that has made its way into pop culture from Monopoly. I would say that my favorite thing from Monopoly, or one thing I like about it, I just like the the absolute fun of someone landing on a property that has a hotel on it and that's yours. I like the trading aspects of it. I like the cool hotel and house pieces. Hmm. I like the massive amounts of money you wield around, even though, you know, with modern games, that money's not quite so much. But when I was a kid, 500 bucks was a lot of money. Yeah. Well, actually, let me think. I don't think it's changed. 500 bucks is still a lot of money. If you'd like to donate to my missions, then you can uh, look me up on the web. And 500 <laughs> bucks is a good amount. Um, so that's all our questions. Joe, have you thought of that game you've changed opinion of? <sighs> no. Okay. Well, so Joe can I answer that. <laughs> all right, that means uh, it's time. You realize I go to America like in a few hours? So Joe's not even, his mind's not even here. My wife is going to kill me. He's in America, but... I know that our show is pre-recorded, but this is actually like, I fly to America and what? i got to be at the airport in 12 hours, so... I'm kind of sidetracked in my mind, but I'm going to focus from now on, Tom. Rest of the game. Ooh. I mean, the rest of the game. <laughs> the rest of the show. I'm going to focus the rest of this crossword puzzle. <laughs> All right. Uh, it's time for our mini reviews. Doo, 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 doo. My mini review is a game that we just played, and it's probably already up on the internet as a full fledged review, but it's called In a Pickle. In a Pickle is a game that's made by Game Right, just the company I talked about last time. They make games that are put into mass market stores like Walmart and such. Uh, they are marketed towards your normal person. And In a Pickle is definitely a party game. It comes with more cards than pretty much any game I've ever seen. I, thought, what, I think it's like 250 cards in the game. <laughs> Each card has a word on it. Universe, door, love, family, pickle. And basically, everyone gets a hand of cards, and then you put four cards in the middle of the table, facing in four different directions. On your turn, you take a card, and you play it, behind one of these cards or in front. For example, if you have basket on the table, I could play orange and I would say there's an orange in the basket. Then Joe could play a card that would say house and then he would say there's a basket in the house. And then Bob could play a card and say that it says dictionary and he would say house is in the dictionary. And so once four there's four cards laid down together, they're all attached together, then each person plays a card and it has to be Whoever plays the biggest card wins. 
Now, that sounds pretty simplistic, but in a multiplayer game, people can argue over it. For example, you can say, there's a turkey in my handbag, and I would say, there's no way there's turkey in your handbag, and you say, well, if it's sliced up and cooked, it's in my handbag. And so then everyone votes, yes or no, to whether your thing is accepted or not. And it, in our last game, things got pretty vicious because many people were shot down consistently. Is love bigger than a family? Is troubles bigger than misery? Is there a jungle in kindergarten? And I mean, we had some pretty knockdown, drag out fights about it. And that made the game fun for me. I, I, I enjoyed it a lot because of that. I like games that cause a lot of player interaction like that. And in a pickle did. I don't know what Joe's opinion of it was. But <laughs> Joe lost. When I was playing it, I just kind of felt, I don't know, kind of. Stop with the clips. People are not going to listen to our show anymore if you play all these clips. What are you talking about? The people like the clips. No. Hey, I think people like the clips. If you like all the clips Joe's playing, email us. If you don't like, the, if you don't mind the clips, email us. If you think Tom's annoying, email us. <laughs> anyway. I guess Joe's not going to do a mini review. No, is it my turn mini review? Yes. All right, my mini review is a game called uh, The Perfect Ten or Perfect Ten. It's a trivia game, and um, I know what you're thinking. You know, a trivia game, yawn, yawn. But this game is a trivia game that has a twist. Basically, you, it, it's a it's a newer game. It's by it was it's it's a remake of a game actually. Oh man, I hit the wrong button. It's a remake of a game by Ravensburger. Now it's out by University Games. Um, two to six players, so you can play teams. It's two teams. It's not like Trivia Pursuit where every man for themselves. Um, it's a pretty short game. You sit across from each other, and you have this um, board that separates you so you can't see each other. And what it is is you have ten trivia questions that are across the top of the board that you that your opponent can read the answers to. And then there's, uh, I think, multiple options that you can choose for the answer. And what it is is you your team will try to decide what they think the correct answers are. It's simultaneous. So the two teams are on opposite sides of this board, and the board is standing up up and down, so you can't, you know, it's, it's vertical. So you... You can't see each other necessarily. You, you, you can't see each other's answers or anything like that. And you talk amongst yourselves and you decide what you think the answers are. And so you put these magnetic strips over what you think the answers are. And then once the time is up, the you the other team will then look at your answers. The, the whole board rotates. Um, it's kind of hard to explain, but it actually spins. The whole board spins like a, like a wheel. And so then you can see what your opponent had for his answers. Then you look at, at the same time, you, you compare your component's answers to what the real answers are, and you tell your opponent by putting another magnetic strip on the board how many answers he had correct out of ten. And so you may write, you may put five or four, and then you ro rotate the board back over, then you start the timer again. And so when you start the second round, you know that you have four correct answers. You don't know which four are correct. And then you keep doing this until the first, until one of the two teams gets all ten correct. And so it's a little bit of a, another thing that I didn't mention is each round you're allowed to ask the other team for what is the correct answer for one of your ten questions. So each time you can eliminate one of the ten questions. So you may think whatever the hardest question is on the first round, say, all right, well, what is the answer to question number one? And so that will eliminate one of the questions, and you'll know the answer is A. And so now you know there's nine left. You have four of those nine correct, and so you got to try to guess. It reminds me a little bit of Mastermind. It's like Mastermind mixed with trivia. It's a team game. It's a party game. I think it's a lot of fun. And uh, it was fairly cheap. I got it for Christmas this year from my father-in-law, <coughs> which is really weird. My father-in-law bought me a board game. So that's my mini review. I think you should pick it up if you like trivia at all. And it's a mind game. Haven't played it. Don't know anything about it. All right. Okay. That was our section of the show, Kangaroos and Turkeys, which is uh, made of a pun of our name, Kangaroos, for Joey and Turkeys for Tom. Even though, in real life, it's pretty much the opposite. So, kangaroos are games that we started out uh, maybe thinking we didn't like them or we did like them and they've just gotten better. Turkeys are games that we liked or didn't like and they've just gotten progressively worse. This like does not mean a turkey is a bad game. A turkey is like our initial sound clip. <laughs> I, I'm going to play it. What, what do you mean you're going to play our initial sound clip? Huh? What sound clip? Well, okay, while well, we have dead air here. I don't know. Okay. You found me beautiful one. Honey, you got real ugly. How's that a turkey? 
This is a game that we thought was good at once, and then it got ugly. <laughs> okay, but it doesn't mean I necessarily dislike the game. No, fact, it, just, it lost my, its luster. My Turkey this time is a game I, I, I certainly do enjoy playing. It's just not as good as it once was. Same here, same here. Well, we'll do our kangaroos first. All right. Go uh, ahead. My kangaroo this week is a, a card game, Karsari. And um, the first time I played it, this is the card game. Um, who makes this game? Is it Decision? Not Decision Games. Rio Grande. Rio Grande, right. Why do I say Decision Games? There's no way in the world do they make that. Anyway, when I first played it, I thought it was really weak, and um, I couldn't get past the theme with the purple and the, the maroon and the yellow pirates and trying to make a ship and all that. But uh, I played it again uh, a couple different times now, and each time I played it, I've come to respect it as a card game. It's just um, you, the object of the game is to is to make um, a pirate ship, and you can staff out your pirate ship with two different colors of cards. Um, you're trying to get one of each of the numbers. I think it's one through 13 or one through 12. Anyway, and when you think that you've got the most pirates out of those two colors, then you go ahead and, and set sail, and then the two opponents have to, uh, either whoever played against you, try to compare their hand to your hand. It's it's an interesting game. It's just a straight card game, but I really like it. My wife likes it, and so it's definitely became a kangaroo for us. Uh, I'll give it a six. Have you played it? Yeah. Oh, that's okay. I'll give it a seven. All right. It started off as a four. Well, okay. <laughs> my my uh, kangaroo is fresh fish. When I first played fresh fish, I thought, bleh. It's just such, it was such a brain burner. It wasn't very interesting at all. So we immediately played it again, and I liked it. It was better. Then I just played it again with four players, and it was even better. It's a good, good game. Yeah, I like Friedman Fries makes good games. I shouldn't have doubted him. <clears throat> I should have kept playing until I liked it. This was Planetary Games that made it? Planetary Games? No, uh, Planary. Planary, Planary. Yes, Planary right. Games makes it, made it. Oh, well, also, his, his own company made it. His own company is uh, 2F, I think it's called, because all his games usually have Fs in them. Friedman Fries is a designer with green hair, bright green hair, and green. all his games come in some kind of green and they all have initials that are F's, like Finster Fleur, or <laughs> Fresh Fish. Or I guess it's called what Fiendish, mm -hmm. Fiendish, whatever it's called. They all these all these F's, and so he's very he's very famous for that. Also, his games are very very different. Power Grid, which it, it's a German name, has two F's, is a great game, and he's just a, he's just a very good designer. So Fresh Fish is my kangaroo. Cool. Now. On to our turkeys. So, Joe, what's your turkey? Alrighty. My, tur <laughs> <laughs> My turkey this week is Citadels. And uh, first couple times I played Citadels, I enjoyed it. I thought it was not that bad of a game. The next time I played it, yeah, it just kind of got, you know, definition for turkey. It just, it just isn't... I will never ask to play this game now. Even though I own the game, I will never specifically, I will never come out and say, hey, let's play Citadels. If someone, someone else brings it or someone else wants to play it, I'll play, and, you know, I'll probably even enjoy myself. But when someone says, you want to play a game, and I go into my game room to go look for games to come back into the room with, I'll come back with three or four titles, I will never come back with with uh, Citadels. I don't know, Tom, you, how do you feel about Citadels? It was a 10 of mine at one time. Now it's down to a 9 or an 8. It's a good, good game, but maybe we've just played it too much. Yeah, that, that's probably what it is. Yeah, but it's still a good game when you got seven people. Sometimes I feel like playing it instead of Bang. Yeah. And the expansion does add a little bit of variety. So, I don't know. My turkey is Starfarers of Catan. Starfarers of Catan has some of the best bits of any game ever. It's beautiful. looks gorgeous. It's a better game than Settlers of Catan. It's fun. It's enjoyable. But it's long. It's very long. Yeah, like... When I say long, I'm talking about two to three hours, which... Isn't that long, you know, with Joe and his almighty war games that last much longer. But I like it because I like, I mean, I, I, it's a fun game, but after maybe an hour and a half, I just wish it was done. <coughs> it's fun, but it's a little slow. Maybe with, and with five and six players, it's even a little bit, a little bit longer than that. But it's still a good game. It's not a bad turkey. It just has gone from being white meat to dark meat. So that's my, my, my turkey. And now it's time for my rant. <laughs> Each week I shed my nice guy persona and rant about something. 
and I was in a good mood today, so it was hard for me to find something to rant about, but I was reminded of this. And here's my rant for today. You don't like expansions. Some people don't like expansions. <laughs> I understand that. Some people, as soon as they see the latest Carcassonne expansion, they'll say, oh, do we really need another Carcassonne expansion? Well, I have the answer for that. No, you don't. You don't need another expansion. Don't buy it. Shut up. I do need another expansion. I want to buy it. So they made it for me. They didn't make it for you. No one's making you buy the expansion. So don't. Don't complain that they're making the expansion. They made it for me. They didn't make it for you. I like it. You may not. Shut up. Ha ha. I love expansions. I really do. Um, sometimes they don't add much to the game. But, and actually, a lot of times they don't add much to the game. But they usually make a game more fun. And I don't know why people sit around and complain that they make expansions for games. Just don't buy them. <laughs> Go buy something else. <laughs> Memoir 44, <coughs> the game that we argued about and Joe was wrong about at the beginning of this show. They're coming out with several expansions. They're adding in some of the stuff that Joe said wasn't in the game. Will that make it a simulation for Joe? We don't know. But either way, <laughs> it will make the game more interesting and more fun. Oh. I like expansions. Sometimes expansions ruin a game, but it's very, very rare. And Either way, no one is twisting your arm to buy the latest Carcassonne expansion. If you don't want to buy it, don't. But there are thousands of people who like Carcassonne expansions, and we will continue to buy them. And to, to all those who are upset about that, we thumb our noses. Thank you for listening to Tom's rant. <laughs> all right. <laughs> now, Joe and I are famous. I mean, we're just absolutely stunningly famous. Yes. So because of our absolute sheer, sheer popularity... We are able to um, just pull in call on any celebrities, player. and they will play games with us. Yes. You know, there's Even people all over the world, and they they are complain that board games are a small a hobby, but we have managed to bring board games to the high and mighty. Access Hollywood is going to have a weekly <laughs> board game session soon. Oh so boy! I actually got Joe to crack down this time and play Puerto Rico. Yes, and you know what? Wow. Well, anyway. So we had uh, five people, a full game of Puerto Rico, and it was, it was, it, I wasn't even playing. I was just watching the game. It was Joe and Bob's brother is Bob who came. Yeah, we had our Bob. And Elmo, Oscar the Grouch, and Cookie Monster all yeah. came from Sesame Street. Yes, and boy, to play Puerto it, was, Rico. it was, it was rough. <laughs> well, Joe doesn't like Puerto Rico to begin with. Oh, he was sitting man. there complaining, and it took us forever. You because, know what, though? Me and Oscar got along great. Yeah. Oscar, I, I thought Joe complained about Puerto Rico. Oscar just kept on. <laughs> we were just, on. we were having a good old time, me like, and Oscar. Shut up, Oscar. If you didn't want to play, why are you here? And he insisted on continually loading the table up with trash. <laughs> There's already enough pieces in this game. Yeah. I didn't need to see a couple of banana peels and rotten stuff, and he apparently thought that would enhance the atmosphere of the game. <laughs> good night. All right, so the game was going good. I was setting up the game because I already knew how to play and I was teaching everybody mm -hmm. and so here I am I'm counting out the colonists and I'm putting them out and I say there's a hundred and all of a sudden <laughs> you wouldn't believe it <laughs> cookie monster man oh my goodness he thought they were chocolate chips C is for cookie that's good enough for me and he started eating the colonists so some people call them slaves some people call them colonists apparently they're also cookies yes they're cookie cookie you know, oh, whatever so uh, we finally tied his hands to the table and just told him that he would tell us what to do, but he still managed to eat a couple more when we weren't looking. I guess they're better tasting than and, we thought. And, you know, next thing was uh, Bob. You know, it turns out that Bob was actually Builder Bob. Bob the Builder, can we build it? Yeah, it was actually Bob the Builder. And Elmo, oh, man, the competition thing kicked in once he realized who it was because of the whole the children's market, you know, and competing for these kids. Yeah. Well, guess what, guess what Elmo did? I, I, I was there. I don't have to guess. <laughs> I'll talk to the viewers at home. All right. Well, <laughs> children, cover your children's ears. He took pictures. He, I can't believe Elmo did this. He picked up one of those, uh, you know, the display, the little map things that you have in front of you, and he flung it at Builder Bob, severing his head. Yeah. See, I, I thought that those little display boards were kind of bland, but apparently they're very sharp. They're very Elmo sharp. Yeah. And Elmo can really whip one, I tell you what. Elmo? I thought it was Oscar. I mean, Oscar. So, Elmo was uh, annoying the whole game. I'm going to take... The, uh, the mayor and then he would sing this song about it like oh, yes, the mayor. <laughs> so annoying oh. Oh, I finally I bowed out I couldn't take it yeah I, I think what happened was because I left the room too but when I came back to get the game 
Well, the, it wasn't there anymore. I'm, yeah, Bob, I'm pretty sure that Builder Bob's plate, lifeless body. Yeah, Builder Bob's lifeless body was on the floor. Uh, okay, that's a third body we have buried in three such weeks. So, oh well. yeah, me and Oscar, he took all the tobacco. <laughs> yeah, it was a it was not a pleasant game. You know, I thought that that playing with the Sesame Street characters would be an enjoyable experience, fun, but here I had to witness a death. But you know what? I, you know, I, I didn't notice smoking a cigarette it was, the whole time. It was right on their mentality level, the game itself. Don't you think? No. It, it was right up their alley. <laughs> I can't believe Joe says these things. Oh, boy. I mean, ay, ay, ay. Well, that was our session report with an all-star this week. If you have a session report that you'd like us to play with an all-star, if there's someone that you'd like us to play a game with, a certain specific game, email us because we have the power to get these people. We'll play the game. And we'll tell you all about it. I mean, it's just so much fun. Sometimes, so far, all three of them have ended in disaster yeah. with the death of one or more people. But we're hoping against hope that maybe a game will end peacefully. And therefore, we can promote you know, peace and harmony and board games to the world. You know, instead of comments like this. What's your name, scumbag? <laughs> that was our obligatory scumbag quote for the, the show. Visit the wondrous House of Whack, the legendary extra-dimensional mansion full of bizarre rooms, fiendish minions, and outrageous artifacts. The house continues to mutate with free downloadable expansions and community-created content. Once you enter, you may never want to leave. Learn more at houseofwhack.net. All right, now at Joe's session of the... Uh... This, this week, I'm, I'm going to start a new session. This is called War Stories with Joe. Oh. <laughs> it's it's time you know you have your little I'm gonna have my own theme music. That's a war. That's from the movie War Games. See, that's even a good movie because it's about war games. And so every once in a while I'm gonna tell you I was in the military seven years. So I'm gonna tell you a, a war story. All right, tell us your war. story. All right, let's see here. I was trying to think of which war story to tell you first. You're not ready. No, I have plenty. Uh, I have the one I was gonna tell you. I'll go ahead and tell. All right, it. we were doing this exercise once in national. I was a tanker in the army. I was uh, a tank commander for Abrams tanks. Actually, at this time, I wasn't a commander. I was nothing but a lowly gunner. Anyway, we were charging the objective at National Training Center in California, and you know what happened? Our tank broke down. And so the rest of the battalion, they kept on going, and my tank, Delta 1-2, we just sat there. And I was very disappointed because it was like it was like the first time that it was like a big battle and all thing. You know, the, the adrenaline was kicking, and our tank just sat there. And on the radio, I could hear the battle going on, and it sounded like our guys were getting massacred by the Op 4. And Op 4 are the, um, the the fictional bad guys, and it was just a war game. And um, my driver, he got out, and he had a big a big hammer. And if you're anything, you know anything about history, military history, tankers are known to fix things with hammers. And so my driver was banging on this 2.5 million dollar tank with a big hammer, and can you believe it? He actually got the tank to start. <laughs> And so we started our tank up, and we went blazing through the desert as fast as we could go. And my tank commander was not with us. He had moved on to another tank when our tank broke down. And so I was in command, and I had watched too many war movies when I was a kid. And I was up in the tank commander's hatch halfway out, holding on to my 50 cal, wind whipping through my hair, charging the enemy. <laughs> and as I crested the hill... There was my whole battalion, all dead, sitting there on top of their tanks, eating their lunch because they were, you know, they were dead and they weren't allowed to play no more. And all the bad guys were sitting there. I'm talking at least 15 bad guy tanks and just my one tank. <laughs> Did you retreat? <laughs> I didn't have time to retreat because before I even knew what happened, I was dead. <laughs> but I tell you what, it was cool. I could hear the the music playing in the background, dun 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 dun, as I came over the top of the hill. And um, I heard about it for weeks afterwards. People would see me walking around and say, Hey, what's up, Pat? And what's up, John Wayne? And all this stuff. But anyway, that's my, my war story of the week. <laughs> Wasn't that exciting, boys and girls? <laughs> it was better than, You just tell them to shut up because it's my rant. <laughs> they need to play test it more. <laughs> okay, time for the gaming news for the week. <laughs> so what's our gaming news this week? We have two of them. Uh, we thought we'd say, Joe, Joe's been wanting to say something to Rick Thornquist for a while. And Rick just started a new session on his, uh, on GameWire. You started, I guess, 
this is July, so he started it a month ago now. Yeah. Uh, he's now, he's the game answer man. Yeah, you right. You sent him a question about games? He does not answer it. My dad used to say that, uh, you know, my dad would say that he couldn't fight his way out of a wet paper bag. <laughs> well, Rick actually does do a good job. Here, type type in that uh, long. Uh, board game geek, geek list, da 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 da, da. Yeah. What is that for? I'll do it. Actually, yeah, um, actually, go go look on Board Game Geek for Nexus op Opus. Nexus Opus, that's a game? Yes. Uh, I want you to look at this game. He hasn't seen anything about it. Nexus Opus is a new game that Avalon Hill is about to come out with. Mm -hmm. And, um, oh, man, I should have done this before. My voice sounds better now. Anyway, Nexus Opus is a new game that Avalon Hill is coming out with this year, and it's All actually right. supposed to be more of a... A war game than another game. Commanding troops on an alien moon. Yeah. Wow. Uh, go down and see if there's a link to any any sites about it. Oh, there's not. Okay, then go to the forums and do a search for it, and you'll and you'll find a, an interesting some pictures of it. All right. So Nexus Opus looks like it's going to have different plastic units and different hexes. It, it actually, when I first saw it, it made me think of Kings and Things, which is an original game that used hexes and different kinds of creatures um so uh i don't see it anywhere on there oh well anyway what was i looking for anyway i don't nexus it, opus yeah it was shown some pictures yes yeah click on that um click on that that, that link right there no nope. all right sorry anyway <laughs> but it looks really cool i found the link on the internet i wrote the link down but Ah, there we go. We he, we, we he found looks, it. Rick Thornquist. He looks like my uh, my old PE teacher from high school. No, junior high. <laughs> I know I shouldn't have brought Rick. I'm sorry. Joe really likes you. Here it is, Nexus Opus picture. Yeah, it looks pretty cool. Yeah. Um, if if go back to the site, there may be uh, there may be some pictures of the hexes, but the hexes look neat. It looks like it's a little bit dumbed down, but you know, I mean, for Joe's style, but I, I think it will be a game that I'll enjoy. Anyway. So what's that got to do with Rick Thornquist? No, that was just another piece of gaming news. Oh, okay. I thought we were going to make fun of Rick Thornquist for a while. Go ahead and make fun. I'm not going to. I like Rick. Rick, I got a few words for you, man. <laughs> you wait till Origins, buddy. That's all I'll say. I don't want to, First of all, I don't want to tip him off. This episode has been posted after Origins. Oh. <laughs> so is he waiting at Origins next year? You know what? You said you weren't going to I'm going to slap him silly at Origins, and then he's not going to know why. And then after Origins, he's going to listen to this, and he's going to say, Oh, that's why Joe Stedman slapped me upside well, the head. Well, tell him why you slapped him upside the head. Because I'm not the second banana. <laughs> well. What more is there to be said? I, I know. Never mind. But I could say you know I could truth. say a few other things, but I'll, I'll just refrain. Yeah, that's good. Okay. I'm, a, I'm a good Christian man. I wouldn't. Here's our top ten list for the week. Do 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 do. This week we're picking our top ten board game companies. Now a couple disclaimers here. I had there's dozens and dozens of companies. I only picked my my my, my favorite ten. But if the company is not on the list, it doesn't mean I I dislike their games anymore. I these are just my favorite company support. Different reasons. Um, I, also, we, I also didn't mention a lot of German companies, mostly because I don't know them as well as I know the American companies. In fact, I think every company I have is from America or England. Oh, no, I got an Italian company. So, but Joe probably picked all war game companies, probably. Mm, but no, we'll see. There's a few that aren't. All right, let's One. do our number. <laughs> our number 10 favorite company. Joe, this, this must be the one that's not a word game company. Fantasy Flight. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> All right. Fantasy Flight, if it wasn't for the stupid box inserts in their games, they may have made number nine. But why is it that every single Fantasy Flight card game or box game, the small box games, all have the same insert? Why can't they just they make enough money in those games? Why can't they get another mold? Cheap. They're so cheap. Well, don't put a box insert in those games. <laughs> I mean, some, sometimes it works. Sometimes it's annoying. It it's just like, I mean, I've, I've found four of those things away already. It's really, ugh. But anyway, other than that. Say the good stuff about them. Fantasy Flight, man, these new mega games that they've been putting out. Twilight Imperium 3, quality. Good quality stuff. War of the Ring. War of the Ring, quality. Doom. Quality. Now, War of the Ring, I mean, War of the Ring is a good game. And I'll even, I'll even say that, uh, what was the first one I said? 
Oh, Twilight Imperium 3, good game. Dune, eh. Doom. Doom. No, Dune's a good game. Doom, eh. You don't like Dune. D-U-N-E? You said you didn't like it. No, I didn't. No. Oh. You must be, maybe I got confused with Doom and Dune. It's not too much I like. I like them both. All right, my number 10 company is Da Vinci Games from Italy. They're a newer company, but um, they, they came on the scene with Bang. Bang's a great game. They also have Dancing Dice and and uh, a lot of other smaller games. And I don't like all their games, but I like a lot of them. I'd say I like half of them. But I love the way the company works. They're just they're, they're fun to work with. They're very easygoing. Are these and the ones that had the flies? No. Pack, a pack of flies? That's Euro games. Oh, okay. All right, number nine company. Multi-man publishing. And they would even be much, much higher if they uh, would hurry up and get out some of these games they said they were going to get out, like the Advanced Squad Leader Rulebook. Or up front redone, or I can name three or four games that you know are supposedly being redone by them. But the things that they have redone, good job. And the Advanced Squad Leader Starter Kit, good job. My number nine company is Z-Man Games. I first got some Z-Man Games a while ago. They were um, cannibal pygmies from the jungles of doom, and uh, they were some B-movie games. And they were funny, humorous card games. They were okay. Then Z-Man got the English rights to Ur Soup and made Primordial Soup. And then they got English rights to some other games and now they're putting out they're putting out a lot of Euro games in American from American company. And I, I just I highly applaud that. They're going up against some big dogs. Big dogs. They're going up against Rio Grand, Uberplay, Mayfair, and they're holding their own. Good for them. Good for Z Man games. Alright, number eight for me is Eagle. Coincidentally my number eight is also Eagle. Really? Yes. Uh, I think Eagle gets lots of crap. They do get lots of crap. Just because their rules suck doesn't mean that they don't got good bits. Just because their <laughs> rules are not as what you want they are, they still have the best. Uh, what I don't like about Eagle games is I want a rule book to be definitive. I don't like reading a rule book and says, and if you don't like it, then just try whatever you want. I don't like that. <laughs> it's just like, I don't mind it, but I, I think their games are getting better and better. Bootleggers and... And uh, Blood Feud in New York were, 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 were pretty tight rule sets. Really? You like them both. No, I thought Bootleggers is weak. You like I, Blood I like, Feud? I like Blood Feud, but I like the theme. It was just fun. Fun to go around and kill other mobsters. Yeah. Very thematic game. Yeah. Um, but Fantasy Flight Man, they got some good bits. But e Eagle Eagle has had consistently good bits. I said Fantasy Flight I meant, I meant Eagle. I meant Eagle has had consistently good bits. Yeah. If you want, if you Even if you don't like the game... I still would say you're never cheated on an Eagle game, even if you hate the game, because at least you have a lot of toy soldiers your kids can play with. I mean, you can find minor criticisms in every game they've made, but <laughs> like the American Civil War game, I mean, why in the world is the map so stinking big, and you got you can't even get all your units into the zone? Yeah, That's they did really make some errors with that map, but their, their, their pieces for that were so cool. The pieces are cool. And the little bit As a kid, man, we would have played with that for hours. Yeah, just the, just the pieces. Oh, so our number eight was the same company. How weird. Cool. All right, number seven, um, I have Avalon Hill, the new Avalon Hill, because... The new one? Well, I think we're talking about modern companies, right? Yeah, that's, I'm, that's I'm not going to talk about something that doesn't exist. Otherwise, I say SPI and all these other companies that don't exist. Uh, the new Avalon Hill. Um, they've had some some nice games that have come out lately, and I know that they are owned by the devil himself, but they, you know, still pretty good stuff. Um, the new Access and Allies games. What else is, has the new Avalon Hill put out? They put out the new Diplomacy game. Um, Monsters yeah. Menace America. <laughs> yeah, whatever. Um, that Nexus Opus game we were just talking about. Uh, Betrayal of House on the Hill. They're doing the, they're doing the Access Nice Miniatures here soon. Robo Rally. That's not Avalon Hill, though, is it? Yeah, the new Robo Rally is Avalon Hill. No, it's not about Access Nice Miniatures. Oh. It's like one big conglomerate. I can't even. I always get it all mixed up. Anyway, so the new Avalon Hill is my number. Okay, my number seven is Uberplay. Uberplay is new on the market. They. Uh, burst on the market by putting out what ten games, which was amazing. They have obviously had a lot of starting capital, mm -hmm. and they they burst on the scene. They they put out their inspiration games, which I appreciate it. I liked Ark of the Covenant, yeah, Carcassonne. They uh, they they have commercials, TV commercials that you can find on the internet. Um, they're fairly cheesy, but <laughs> they're still doing a lot. I think their motto is the best games you've never heard of, and they put out some good games. Joe likes their New England game. That's that, all right. Is that one of your turkeys now? Yeah, definitely. You're, you're still with Thunder Tom. Oh, I didn't know. That's okay. 
what is that? Next week. Next week's turkey? Yeah. Well, it's actually like oh, two months from now, but next week's. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so there's a, they, they still put out a lot of good games, and they added a lot of, they broadened the American market, so props to Uberplay. Good, good. Number six for me is Decision Games, and uh, this is a war game company. Um, they get a lot of get a lot of garbage from people, but they're still putting out some pretty good quality games. I did a mini review on one of their games, that Lightning Midway, Lightning Midway, um, good good little card game. They're putting out some other good games lately, and uh, I keep the help they keep it up. All it's, right. it's 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 simple for war game companies. <laughs> My number six is Warfrog. Now, really? Everyone knows, even that, know. <laughs> everyone knows, I guess, now that Warfrog makes some kind of mistake in their games, but their games are so good. Struggle Vampires, uh, Age of Steam, Princes of the Renaissance, um, Way Out West, Liberté. They're just tremendous games. They only put out one game a year, but it's a good one. You, I, I, I say this now. Whatever game Warfrog is putting out this year, you can buy it, and it will be worth it. Pre-order it now. I don't even know if you can, but Warfrog makes good games. Um, they're unfortunately often hard to find and hard to get a hold of, but their games are very good. Yes, they do two small, two, two small print runs too. Well, yeah, but they're a small company trying to survive. It seems like they make more money if they need more copies. Maybe. They're not risky. <laughs> Whatever. Number five. Um, number five. For me is Lost Battalion Games, LostBattalion.com, LostBattalions.com. They have they're making a whole series of new little games. Um, they're kind of taking over for the old uh, magazine games, I guess, or the old pocket games. They, these are the ones that did uh, Sergeants on the Eastern Front. They do battling, battling, battling battleships or something like that. I can't remember. Anyway, it's uh, it's a good new company, and um, they seem to have a good, lot of good internet support, and they're they're releasing new scenarios, free stuff every couple of weeks it seems like on the internet expansions for their games so I like that alright my number five game is face to face games face to face is, is very new they uh, made their mark with me by reprinting several Sid Saxon games they uh, I'm the boss and sleuth and now they're reprinting royal turf you know for Joe because <laughs> yeah, he loves right. it so much yeah. but they're also they're, they're printing a lot of different fun games they're adding a lot of variety to the market uh, their, their president is very interested in getting more of the Euro games out in the American market. So I, I really enjoy face-to-face -face games. They're a great company, and they have good vision. Number four. Number four for me is Phalanx Games. And uh, they just got really good quality. They did the New House Divided. They did Age of Napoleon, Alexander the Great. They did some good games. Um, I really like the quality. It just says a lot to me. And they even can make a Richard Bird game look good. <laughs> Phalanx? Yeah, they can. Yeah. Are you talking about Nero? Yeah. Was Nero good? It was all right. I've only played it once. You've actually played it? Yeah. Uh, from what I read on the internet, it's a, it's a dog of a game. Yeah. Oh, you know, War of the Ring? <laughs> but they didn't do the Fantasy Flight version. As, as you know, there was a, co uh, a co well, well, cooperation, right? Whether I'm not, I'm, not talking about, I'm not talking about Phalanx. I'm just talking about Nero itself. Oh. That, that specific game. No, I know. I'm just saying, this is, they're, they're credited with the War of the Ring. What was that, a cooperation game? I don't know. Maybe. They must have cooperated on the bits. Um, my number four company is Real Grand Games. They were the first. Well, actually, Mayfair was the first. But Real Grand, he, Jay still brings in. If I'm, if I'm wondering if a Euro game is going to make it to America, I can pretty much guess that if it does, it's going to be underneath the Real Grand. He does all the Carcassonne games. He does all these piles and piles of games. Each year, there's probably 20 or more Real Grand uh, Rio Grande doesn't really make their own games. They just give us an English version of German games. He produces them at the same time that the German companies do, just with English components. Right. And I really like it. I'm glad he does that. It makes it worth getting them. Hey, did you like that Prince game? We played that before, didn't we? Prince? I have not played it. I thought we played it. Me, you, and Bob. But I haven't. Oh, okay. Number three. Number three for me is Shrap Metal Games. Um... I'm noticing a theme here with Joe's game. Oh, same with you. <laughs> Shred Metal Games. Really, really friendly people. They did a Lock and Load and Lock and Load Anzex. I think they got another game coming out here soon. Um, just really friendly. Kind of almost... I was really surprised when I met them in person at Origins uh, last year. 
just seems like a couple guys and selling some games, but, but they were fairly professional. I mean, they were pretty professional, um, but just real friendly, and they won me over. So you can't be friendly and professional? <laughs> is that what you're saying? You know what I mean. It is. They were just like, wow, this is the company? <laughs> and uh, they were just good people, and uh, they won me over. I'll, I'll probably buy whatever they put out just because they just they were so nice to me the first time I met them. And the game itself is a good quality game. It's got good good uh, good graphics. Um, the rule book is nice, and their online their online support with a tutorial for the game and everything that you can play right on the internet. It's just good stuff. Hmm. Well, my number three company is Mayfair. When they have certainly gone up my estimation, but I really like the, their their games they're putting out now. They partnered with Da Vinci, so any game that Da Vinci puts out, Mayfair puts out. But Mayfair also puts out a lot of good games on their own, and their quality has massively improved, especially for a company who uh, produces their games in America. The only problem with Mayfair is their games are probably higher priced than the other companies, but they're still pretty good games. Interesting. All right, number two. Number two for me is L2 Games, and this is another board game company, but, man, they really do a good job. They are kind of pricey. But you pay for what you get. You get a good quality game. They did a remake of Russian Campaign. They did a remake of Streets of Stalingrad. And they did uh, Bitter Woods. Beautiful, beautiful bits. To the point where you don't even want to... My Streets of Stalingrad game, I don't even want to open it. It's just so pretty. Yeah, that's why I buy games. Because I want to buy them so I can look at them and say, Oh, how pretty. Oh, I never want to open you, my <laughs> precious... <laughs> See, whenever Joe knows he's wrong and doesn't have a good argument back, he just hits me. No, I just like to hit you, Tom. Yeah. Anyway, no... Several um, people have said that. All right, my number two game was Fantasy Flight Games. Fantasy Flight, Joe already said that was your number ten, right? Mm-hmm. But I really like Fantasy Flight. They're tremendous. They just get better and better and better. The games they're putting out, Doom, uh, Game of Thrones, War of the Ring, and all the massively good games that are coming out this year. It's so exciting to see their lineup. Uh, I, I, I just can't wait to play all their new games. I'm really looking forward to Origins just to see the Fantasy Flight stuff. Cool. It's pretty exciting. And now our number one board game company. Can you guess mine, Tom? Well, I already saw it, so. No, well, would you have guessed it? Because you hadn't said it yet, yes. I mean, with the hundreds, I know with the hundreds of titles of games they have and the, the, the dozens and dozens of their games that I own. I didn't realize you liked their policies that much, though. But go ahead. And their, their groundbreaking and awesome P500 program. Yeah, I don't know if it's groundbreaking. <laughs> GMT Games, man. They are the bomb. They're my favorite uh, producer of games. They just put out a huge consortium of games. There's so many games that you can pick from. Every year they just put out new titles. Um, what did I get last year? I picked up, I think I picked up seven GMT games last year, Origins. No, six. Well, I mean, everything from... Uh, Europe and Golf, which is this huge block game, to I bought a game called Gringo, which is a specific game about uh, the Mexican and American War. And you know, it's just, wow. they got card games and war games and block games. The It's a mom-and-pop operation. At least it, it appears that way when you meet them. They're just real friendly, like a mom-and-dad kind of thing. And, um, wow. I, I can't say anything about them. I mean, anything bad about them. I just really, and they were really generous to me. And that's not part of why I made them my number one company, but they were just real generous when I when I was t- talking to them last year, and they're just a good company. And uh, they have a huge following on Consim. The GMT board on Consim is very very active. I mean, it's so active that you have to I have to unsubscribe at times because I just have too many. I got to click like five times to go through all the messages, and it's just annoying. <laughs> but anyway, what a good message board Consim World has. All right, my number one company. Yeah. Guess what my number one is. Days of Wonder? Yes. Days of Wonder, the company who can do no wrong. Every game they put out, mega hit. Shadows of Camelot, Memoir 44, Ticket to Ride Europe, Ticket to Ride, Mystery of the Abbey, Pirate's Cove, Fist of Dragonstones. I mean, we're talking massively good games. And you get really cool necklaces that you can wear around the club. Well, Queens of Necklace was aspiring to greatness, (laughs) but they still did a good job. And uh, Days of Wonder has great customer support. I mean, I look right now on Board Game Geek, and you can answer questions and win a copy of Shadows Over Camelot if you answer some a, a trivia game question. Yeah, I saw that. Well, we have a couple extra minutes here on the show. Do you want to quick do the uh, the contest? 
All right. All right, because it, it's over by now, okay. so we can answer these. According to legend, who was King Arthur's father? Oh, I know that one. It was. Well, you guess first, and I'll tell you what I think. This one? Which one? C. No, it's B, Uther Pendragon. Ah, oh, okay. You didn't know that? No. Guinevere was romantically connected to... You'd be dumb not to know that one. King Arthur and Lancelot. Yeah. Arthur received his famous sword Excalibur from the Lady of the Lake. Yeah, that was easy, too. The Camelot legend, uh, which knight often called, called the Grail Knight, is connected to the Holy Grail. Uh, this one here, right? No. I would say that it's none of the above. It, I thought it was the uh, the son of Lancelot, uh, Trish, 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 Tristram. Yeah. Duh. Merlin serves as a magician. Or as an advisor. And a prophet. He's all of the above, man. Oh, tricky question. Okay, number six. Morgan Le Fay is who? Which one? Do you know? Sir Kay's lover, Arthur's half-sister, Galhad's mother, Guinevere's daughter. Oh, you're right. It's Arthur's half-sister. What political leader of the 20th century is most closely identified to Camelot? Charles de Gaulle, Winston Churchill, John F. Kennedy? Or <laughs> Oh, dude, that's too easy. Yeah. It's the Kennedys. The Lady of the Lake is also known as who? Well, that's a tricky one. I think it's Vivian. You think it's so? Well, the Aqua, this seems too Aqualina? It just uh, seems I think it's Vivian, but we'll see. What do you want to put? V or B? Well, or B? you put it. It's, it's your, it's your right. thing. In Shadows Over Camelot, knights must fight the Black Knight. In the Camelot legend, what other color knight do they confront? Green? I didn't know you knew that. I've read some of Question it. Question 10. What is the air speed velocity of an unloudened swallow? Oh, okay. The answer, come on. It's A, African or European swallow, right? Well, no, it's all of the above. Yeah, because they, they, right. they debated all those things. Let's see how many we got right. Oh! Correct, correct, correct. Which one did you get wrong? Oh, Vivian. Oh, it's Percival. Oh, I was wrong. It's Percival, and you were right on Vivian. Yeah. Oh, well. Well, folks. Regardless of the quiz, if you didn't win the quiz and you didn't get the free game of Shadows of Camelot, buy one anyway. Yeah. I like Days of Wonder because they're always promoting their games you're, you're in cool of, ways. Cool. I'm kind of what? kind of loud. You're popping in my ear. Is this better? <laughs> Can you hear me now? <laughs> okay. Thanks for listening to the Dice Tower. Uh, I'm Tom Vassell. This is Joe Stedman. No, I'm Joe Stedman. I said this is... No, this is Tom Vassell. And I'm... that's Joe Stedman. <laughs> <laughs> and we got some hot lava. Hot lava death. <laughs> um, this is our last non-live show. Our next show should be live. Yes, it should. So, don't forget, if, if, you think, if you think Joe is right, if you think Joe is right about memoir, <laughs> stop the music! If you think Joe is right about memoir, uh, and you think it's not a simulation, then email me and email me either way. You see that evil will always triumph because good is dumb. Okay, which is anyway. <laughs> evil will not triumph in this case. <laughs> email us. Let's see how many votes we can get that say Joe Stedman is memoir wrong. forty-four is not a simulation. Yeah. Mark it down. Take it to the bank. Get out of the mic. I can do that too. It is a simulation. All right. Do, 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 do. Well, thanks for listening to the Dice Tower at GameFest.com. Have a great week, and we'll see you next time. Yep. Email us at thedicetower at gmail.com. Bye-bye. And, yes, once again, I cringe as I tell you, please, we will not do those so-called celebrity session reports again. <laughs> anyway. Enter our contest, get involved, ask us questions so we can have something to answer on our next show. Um, make comments and just always tell us. We want to know how good of a job are we doing or how good of a job are we not doing. We're always striving to be better. Either way, we'll see you next week. This is Tom Vassell, and I'm really glad that you chose to listen to our show. Thanks for joining us today. Stop by next week for Episode 111, in which we discuss our Top 10 Mayfair games. Our sponsor this show was Dream Punk Productions. Check out House of Whack, a brand new game from Dream Punk Productions. House of Whack beat both Reiner Canizia and Bruno Faduti in a hot dog eating contest. Well, not really. Learn more at houseofwhack.net. Until next week, this is Eric Summerer, and you've been listening to The Dice Tower, 